Good morning and welcome to Hope Community Church. Uh, those of you who are joining us online and welcome to all who are here. Uh, I am Pastor Nathan and I get to be the guy to uh, lead us through uh, our, our scripture reading and communion and prayer requests as we uh, come together as a community to worship God this day. I invite you to join me and open your Bibles to Psalm 139. Uh, because he's worthy, um, it is awesome to consider how he made us. And this is one of the Psalms that uh, ascribes worthiness to God based upon how he created us. And we'll be looking at, at that in a little bit in the message time, so I just thought it appropriate to consider uh, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I encourage you as you uh, read along and listen to these words, that you just be asking God in the quietness of your heart, uh, is there anything now, Lord, between us? Something to agree with you about. Uh, the scriptures tell us that before we observe the Lord's table, we should examine ourselves. And I believe that just includes asking God that question. Is there anything now that I need to admit to you, agree with you about, confess to you in the quietness of my heart? as I prepare myself to take these elements again in remembrance of you, of, of all that you've done for me and for us, and what that means in terms of uh, how I want to live and respond to you. I'm gonna not read the whole psalm, but a significant part, um, starting with the first 18 verses. This is a psalm of David, and he begins, O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is bright as a day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would court count them, they will be more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. And skipping down to verses 23 and 24, the closing of the psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And this can be our prayer as we prepare our hearts for communion. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, as we come to your table again, this uh, symbolic way that you <clears throat> prescribe to us to, I, I consider kind of a reboot, a reminder, uh, getting back uh, to that intimate and close relationship with you that we were made for, that you came to make it possible for us to experience but it is so easy for us to drift away from. And as we come together 
Lord, we just want to uh, invite you to expose to our awareness anything that is not pleasing to you, that has separated us from intimate communion with you. And then as we uh, go and take a piece of bread representing your body, which was broken for us, and a cup which represents your blood, which was shed for us, may it renew in our hearts that, that hope and that confidence and that joy that we are your dearly loved children and that all that we need for life and godliness you have given to us. That we can become shining examples of what it means to be your followers. And that we're ready then to give an answer to anyone who asks us for the hope that we have. Uh, we can go through life with a sense of confidence, not in our own abilities or having all the answers or knowing more than other people know, but just in knowing who we are in you. May our taking of these elements this day remind us of these truths, and may uh, your hope and joy fill us so that we may go out uh, from here renewed in our, in our sense of who we are, who are our people, and, and what people like us do in the lives that you have given to us. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Invite you to uh, take one of the, the go to one of the stations here in the room. If you're at home, uh, get your elements and just uh, if each of the people that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, give them a piece of bread and then a cup, and then in remembrance of our Lord, take these elements. thank all of you who have been uh, continuing to give faithfully even during these uh, different times. Um, actually, uh, amazingly, in the year 2020, the giving is up at the Hope Community Church, which I haven't checked any other churches, but it surprised me that there wouldn't have been some uh, downturn just because not everyone is showing up, but it, uh, I just want to honor and thank you guys, and I know God is the one that keeps track of that. Uh, I don't know what that is for any of you, but uh, we have adjusted, as you know, uh, offering basket in the back rather than passing the baskets to the church, and some people are mailing their gifts in. If they're still those who write checks, 
to 511 North Main Street, Franklin Ruth 48734. And more are giving online on our website, hopefrankenmuth.org. There's a link at the bottom of the page to do that. And thank you guys for, for doing that and even setting it up as a regular uh, recurring, either weekly or monthly or every other week, however often you are getting your payments uh, from your jobs. And we appreciate that. And I know God uh, loves cheerful givers, so thank you. <coughs> uh, I have some prayer requests here, but before I go to the Lord in prayer uh, for us all, I just invite any of you here that have an additional request to um, let me know if there are any additional requests. Anyone have a prayer request that you would like us to pray for this day? Praise in the back. Our daughter and her family got to South Dakota safely, and they have a house with a yard with kids playing, so that's exciting, and um, everything went well. Okay, Sierra and Daniel, the Buckles, uh, daughter and son-in-law, and grandkids made it safely to Rapid City, South Dakota, have a house with a yard. That is awesome. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for um, moving is hard and going a long distance across states is hard. Just going across the state of South Dakota is hard. Uh, so to move from Minneapolis all the way to Rapid City, uh, it is a beautiful area there on the west side of South Dakota, and we thank you that you have brought Sierra and Daniel safely, even though transportation was not uh, the newest version of, of the vehicle. Uh, they made it safely, have a house that's going to provide for them uh, and their kids uh, adequately, places to play, and I just thank you that uh, Daniel has a job, and we pray that all the things that uh, we need to have happen when we move to a new place, learning where to go, to do certain things, uh, getting friends, finding a church, that you would guide their, their steps through those, those processes. And uh, we thank you for those who were here yesterday in uh, just various bits of time for praying for our, our country and just for the world, basically, that there would be a return to you. Um, for those who, who have followed you and are coming to you for those who have not. Lord, we want to pray for the students and teachers and uh, parents. Um, just with this time, I, I know some families are still trying to work through what they're going to do on site, at home, how's that going to work. And so I just pray that, uh, that you would help them to keep uh, the relationships a priority uh, while they figure out the problem and solve it uh, in the best way possible. For all the COVID-related implications for people in terms of isolation, in terms of uh, ec economics, their jobs possibly, um, I just pray for uh, wisdom and particularly for governing leaders, people who make decisions, people who own businesses to make wise next step decisions uh, that would uh, guide uh, the, the company or the state or the country. Uh, through this in the best possible way where we'd be able to live peaceable lives and, and that you would enable us to, to uh, be your strong warriors in this world during this time. Lord, for uh, Jeannie's mom, Norma, as she's uh, just experiencing some of the processes of aging, uh, some memory issues, the beginnings of Alzheimer's, for Eugene, who's 92, and caring for her, who's 86. And uh, just pray uh, for that, for Jeannie and Jane and Doug as they work together as children to care now for parents who at one time cared for them. And just for us as we go down this afternoon and provide whatever support and help we can just for a few hours, I just pray for that as well. We want to bring to you Jean Largis as she is going through cancer treatments. Uh, Mike Fisher and Jean as they journey with their uh, cancer diagnosis of Mike. And uh, Lord, I just pray that their hearts would, would 
be closely bonded to you and they would sense your presence through this. And Lord, uh, we we know that our days are in your hands, so we just said trust both Gene and, and Mike and uh, and their spouses to this this time, difficult time of, of serious illness. For Jeanette, who's here with us today, we thank you that she's able to be with us for the continued healing of her leg and then a couple other issues that she's uh, facing and dealing with medically. I just pray that you'd give her uh, a piece about that and that you'd provide uh, the healing that her body needs for that. Thank you that she has a caregiver who has a good spirit about him and for day for strength for that as well. For uh, Julie Leach's dad, Larry Lingle, as he continues in the Tyler Trauma Center in Texas to recover from a serious accident on his little ranch, and I just pray you would bring healing to his body and comfort to his soul. If he doesn't know you, Lord, I just pray that you bring him to yourself through this. For our partners in ministry, Redeemed Children in Haiti and all that is uh, going on there, for uh, Hope House Detroit and the Radcliffe family, and now we know him a little better as he's come and spoken to us and as the many families and kids that they will be impacting, we just pray that they would be able to offer uh, a sense of joy and relationality to these kids who many times are, are probably struggling and feeling not, not loved and maybe not seen. And for our time here today, Lord, I just pray you'd give me the words to say that would open our hearts to uh, what you want us to take, take to heart and, and aim us in the direction that you want us to be pointing towards for your glory. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, we have uh, a nursery and children's classes whenever... Uh, there are those who want to uh, take part in those, and for that to happen, we, it's good for us to have a plan uh, to be able to be flexible and responsive, and if you'd be interested in being on that team that's ready to go when there are kids uh, ready to receive your love and involvement, contact Christina, and we're just asking for a commitment of one Sunday per month. We have uh, men's groups that meet right here on Thursday mornings at 6 and 7.30. And I, I've just given it a new name. It's Men Joyfully Journeying Together Towards Maturity. So we're actually in the book of Acts studying how the story of how the first church um, came together and what was going on there with all those people uh, to make that happen so that we are actually here today as a result of them. The young adult group continues to meet. It's moving to Thursdays at 6 p.m. It actually has moved. We just didn't alert you to that quicker uh, last week. So it's moved to Thursdays at 6 p.m. And they have a new study starting called Greater Than, uh, which is led by uh, Pastor Francis Chan. And they're going to be meeting in here. And then the prayer group meets a half an hour later, and they're going to be meeting in the youth room. So we'll have two groups uh, here on Thursday nights. And now we have an opportunity for anyone who might have something they would like to share. Does anyone have a journey story update that they would like to share? Okay. Well, we're, yes. Yes. Mitchell, you got one. You got to get up here, bud. <laughs> Mitchell Buckles has one. You don't have to sit down. Just get in front of the camera. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to do a recap of the prayer march and uh, the return that took place in D.C. yesterday. Uh, it was very powerful, and if you weren't able to make it, you know, here or to D.C., uh, I hope you were just praying at your house or, uh, you know, wherever you were. And um, I just, it really moved me, uh, especially because, sorry, <laughs> um, reading about the uh, Laodicean church and what it says the Laodicean church is like um, in uh, Revelations chapter 3, uh, verse 14, um, through, well, <laughs> uh, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. 
would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself. The shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and say I to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. And so yesterday, it definitely saw a church that in D.C. and in all the places that they've met and stuff that was on fire for God and repented not for their individual shortcomings and for this country and the world's shortcomings in allowing laws that are not our Lord's governing laws to be passed and about standing idly by and doing nothing about it. Um, and I just, the repentance that came out of that day, it was beautiful to see here on this earth but I'm sure it was even more beautiful in heaven where God had the incense of prayers coming up to him. Just, I can't even imagine how, I mean, I mean there's 60, over 60,000 people there and all those prayers were being lifted up to God. I mean, it's probably been a while since that many prayers were lifted up to heaven in one day. I mean, it was a glorious day, I'm sure, in heaven as well as it was on earth yesterday, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Mitchell. So we are in uh, message number two of a series that I've called Relational Parenting 101. Now look around and how many people here are at home with kids? Not that many. So uh, it doesn't just apply to people at home with kids. So some alternative titles could have been Relational Transformation or Relational Maturity or identity and relationship-based maturity. Now those are kind of technical and make more sense when you understand uh, the, the story of the series, which we will uh, be unpacking. So today, um, maximizing the two-system brain God gave us. You could say, I thought this was church. That sounds like a science class. <laughs> Well, interestingly, the, the God that we worship also created our brains. And he created our brains with two systems that are designed to work together. Unfortunately, and I believe there's various reasons for this, but maybe as long as the last 400 years, some of the, the dynamic power and the way this is supposed to work has been kind of lost. And so that many Christians basically live their Christian lives with, uh, based on the premise of if I can learn the right information and make right choices, then I will become mature. And it's not that information and choices aren't important, but God has given us something to uh, greatly increase our potential for transformation. The problem with that model is uh, I'll just give you an example um, from my life. Uh, yesterday I was involved, uh, actually the last two days, in a project um, replacing some windows. Now if you've done replacing windows before, piece of cake, right? But I've never done replacing windows before. I talked to a contractor about doing it and he's like, oh yeah, I'll get back with you someday. <laughs> And that day hadn't come, so it's like, okay, I, I have a weekend, we could work this out. I got on YouTube, figured, you know, it doesn't look that hard. And so uh, I take out these three garage windows and uh, then start looking at, like, the packages that I have. You know, the three windows to, to replace them. And the stuff on the video and my windows and holes didn't, didn't go together. <laughs> Uh, a couple problems was uh, my house was built in 1962 and 2x4s two were different sizes than they are now. So everything about the video assumes the 2x4s are the same size for the window you're putting in as for the window you're taking out. So 
long story short, there was a bunch of details that the video didn't explain. I felt like a novice about this. I didn't have the information I needed to make the right choices to end up with a good result. And then Jeannie asked me a question or gave a suggestion or something. I can't even remember what she did. And you know what I did? I kind of snapped at her and was grumpy. So basically having the right information, <laughs> making right, you know, you can, you can react. What you will do, what we will all do is react out of, in a sense, our default character. And thinking and making decisions isn't fast enough to keep that from happening. But God has made our brains in such a way that if we will align ourselves and understand how he wants change to happen, we can actually be literally transformed so that before I get grumpy and snappy, something kicks in to keep that from happening. That's the right system. So when I say the two system, I'm talking about your left system and your right system. Your right system is designed by God to be in charge, the master system, and it has some, some significant focuses and priorities that enable transformation to happen faster than thought. Your right hemisphere is actually operating faster than you can think about what you're going to do next. So imagine the powerful impact if when something happens negatively that tended to trigger us in the past, based upon our story or whatever, that was what was going on for me. I don't have what it takes, I'm inadequate, I don't know where to get the right information, and this thing's going to be a mess. Now, I'm just, I don't always fill in the end of the story. The windows are in. <laughs> uh, I got through it. But one of the things I did is I started practicing some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you in the coming weeks, and it didn't take me nearly as long to identify the inappropriateness of what I had done to Jeannie that has nothing to do with whether the windows get in or not, but is more important than whether the windows get in or not. It is the loss of that central reality that causes us to struggle with uh, character issues, recurring sins, being triggered over and over by the same kinds of things, because literally our core character doesn't ever get to the point of transformation for the right system to say, wait a second, time out. That's not who you are. What you just did isn't who you are. So our right system literally six times a second is basically saying, who am I? Who are my people? What do people like us do in situations like this? This has nothing to do with windows, right? Now, the left system is like, how do you figure out how to put in windows when you've never done it before? It's problem solving to the max. And God has gifted us in an amazing way so that when a challenge or a problem comes before us and the left system kicks in and says, how does someone who's never put a new window in to a house and the windows he's got doesn't fit the video that he watched, how does that happen? And the left system starts going, well, you could do this, you could try that. You're a pretty creative guy. You, you know how to use tools. And so then you solve the problem, which is what happened. But if you forget who you are, and you're in the middle of feeling frustrated about it, and your wife asks a question or says something to you that, doesn't, that triggers you in some way for some reason that has nothing to do with her, and you act like you always act. So, I'm just telling you there's hope that that doesn't happen. And in regards to our parenting series, Relational Parenting 101, learning about this and how to do it and practicing it is one of the most powerful things that a parent can do for their kids for the time that they have them with them. And you could just say, what is the goal of parenting? That whenever that kid leaves my house, 18, 25, hopefully by 30, you know, you could say, but sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> Will they be, in, in their core character, able to handle the kind of things that, that life brings? Because Jesus told us, in this life we will have trouble. So have we given them the context within which to live out of the character of who they are? I'm, I'm 
assuming here that, that in the context of the family, hopefully they've trusted Christ as Savior, but that's their decision. You can lay the groundwork and create a context that would make it very inviting for them to do so, but they still have to decide that for themselves. So that's kind of the hope of this series, and I'll, uh, I'll watch the clock here because we, we have more than one week to, to get over there. So I've been thinking about this literally for probably about three years. Uh, I've been doing reading about the intersection of what God says about how we are made and you could say people problems and solutions and character development, discipleship, spiritual formation, whatever you want to call the relationality of God and the Trinity, the fact that it seems like some of the younger ones, uh, millennials, Gen X, the ones that follow Gen X, Gen Z, or whatever they call them, some of them don't seem drawn to the kind of Christianity or church that they have experienced or that they make up a story about as being there. It's not necessarily the reality of the church they're in that they're reacting to, but maybe just the, the perception out in our culture about what Christians are like and what church is like. It has become my conviction that if uh, Christians and churches would embrace and, uh, and in one sense adjust and go back to the reality that I believe the early church knew and maybe up until the, the 16th and 1700s, that the focus was more on what I would call a relationally centered view of Christianity, walking with God, being who God wants us to be. Not an informational, problem-solving approach. Right information, right choices, equal maturity. Now, in the past 25 years, uh, brain science has, has basically discovered what God knew, obviously because he made us, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Brain science has discovered some of these things, which then start, I would almost say, for the way it's functioned for me is the light was shined on some of these things that are in scripture that I used to think about in a different way. But now having kind of been exposed to this and then thinking about, well, what was Paul saying there? Or what was Jesus saying there? And then realizing, I think he was targeting the right system, not the left system, in those words. So a lot of times what we'll do, and, and I mean, I went to four years of seminary, and basically the way they taught us is, if we give you all this information for four years, you'll be a mature guy that's able to pastor a church when you get done. Now, you guys didn't know me back then, but I can assure you, uh, I might have been more mature than I was before, but in some ways maybe I was less mature because it was so dominantly focused on let's give you this information so you'll make the right choices. And literally one of my friends in seminary, uh, I, I went to, they call it baby Greek, so it's a first, uh, it's a 10-week intensive course on one year of, of, of Greek, and that's all you study for 10 weeks. And you literally get through what normal students will get through in two semesters of like twice a week classes. So I'm taking baby Greek. Ten weeks later, I'm going back. A week after that, we get married, go back to seminary. Not something I would recommend for the start of a, a married life. I'd recommend a year of no seminary and no graduate school uh, after you get married before you start a challenge like that. So anyhow... Uh, I made this friend there, and we were kind of kindred spirits. We are both engaged. We are both going get, to be getting married. Um, he had been in a uh, campus ministry, one of the, the noted campus ministries, that was built on this model of if we can get the right information to these people, then they will make right choices and they will be mature. And this guy was really good at information and, and knowing the right information. And so they said, you should go to seminary. So he did. And so we get to know each other, and we would go play basketball in the, in the neighborhood of Dallas. Two short white boys who could shoot, playing basketball in the hood, basically. And we did pretty good. We did pretty good. And it's like, how can those guys, how can those two short white guys beat us? We play defense, we set picks, you know. But anyhow, we would start talking. One day he asked me, he goes, hey, how much do you pray? What? <laughs> How much do you pray? Is there an amount of time you're supposed to pray to be mature? Well, that's what he thought. 
things weren't working very well. And the way he, the model he'd been given was basically, you know, you learn the information, you do the practices or whatever, and then you become mature. And he wasn't feeling it. So he thought he needed to pray more. He was up to two hours a day and feeling guilty because it wasn't enough. I wish I would have known then what I know now in order to have a conversation with this friend. Before graduation, he had completely bailed on his Christian walk, his wife. He never went into ministry. I don't even know if he's walking with God to this day. They don't know where he's at from, like, the seminary records. You know, does anyone know where this kid is? And I think he made it, maybe made it through two years or maybe three years of information gathering to make right choices beyond whatever he had had, you know, in college in his campus ministry. There are churches that have done surveys, and their assumption was if we present good services with exciting worship and good teaching and some extra things for people to do, you know, to, to kind of practice their, their, you know, information choices and that, that that will produce maturity. So then they did a survey of all their people, their attenders, and they said, basically, over the past five years, have you noticed that your character has matured? You know what they found out? No. <coughs> Basically, they found out they could find no correlation between regular attendance at well-planned church services and people's character maturity. There wasn't a correlation between... Their basic assumption was if we can do these events, get people to show up, the result of them showing up and experiencing what we planned for them will be that they will mature. But it wasn't happening. Now, I'm not saying the answer to this is don't have, don't have events or don't teach God's Word, but if we do it without the systems that God has put in our brains working together, we're going to find similar, similar results. So then as I'm thinking about all this stuff for about three years and reading and all that kind of stuff, um, I started thinking about passages of Scripture, and they'll just pop into my mind. What about that one? So yesterday, I think it was yesterday, Ephesians 4 and 5. If you want to open your Bibles, you can. But I just want to just share with you a couple of the things that, that popped into my mind. I go, I think this is talking about the alignment of our right system, the way God made us, and he's telling us things, in a sense, inviting us to be transformed, including our right system, not just figure out the problem and how to solve it non-relationally. And I would say without joy. So notice uh, these passages. Uh, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. I wrote it on my little notepad here, so I'm going to just share my, my little thought notes here. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. You must no longer walk or live as the Gentiles do. And that would be like non-believers or uh, like you did before you came to Christ. Don't, you need to change, be transformed, be different, be more mature. Information. Okay, so we, we change, right? If we hear, and the Bible says don't do this, it's like, oh, from then on. Don't be grumpy with your wife. Okay, check the box. I'm not going to do that anymore. And then I get into a window project and I do it. It's like, oh, Lord, confess my sins. That is the wrong way. I'm going to try harder next time. But guess what will happen? If this right system doesn't get on the team, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Because by the time it's happened, you need something that's happening faster than conscious thought. Otherwise, you'll be triggered by all these things, and you'll keep doing the stuff that you always do. Even though you believe God, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Bible, you know, something else has to be going on for, literally, for us to shine like stars in the universe, and people go, that's a different way to act. As they see us responding, not because we think about it, it's like we become the person that acts a different way before we even think about it. And that is possible, not by trying hard, not by taking magic pills or drugs or anything like that, but by uh, 
as Paul tells Timothy, train yourself to be godly. This is one of the verses that came to my mind. 1 Timothy 4, 8, I think it is, or 4. Anyhow, it's in there. Train yourself to be godly, 4, 7. What kind of training? What do we do? And I believe the things that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks are the kinds of things that we can literally be training ourselves in and allowing God to train us in so that we literally become godly, different. Our characters become transformed. So uh, he says, uh, don't walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of your minds, and the futility of like, how come I keep getting triggered by this stuff over and over? How come it's not changing? Darken in your understanding. Should I pray more? How about two hours? Is that enough? Alienated from the life of God. Not alienated from information about God. Alienated from the life of God. So what does that look like? To literally know the information but be alienated from the life of God. Why? Because of hard, calloused hearts. So the premise I'm operating from now is that there are things that need to happen to uh, soften my heart, uncalluses it, and it literally be trained towards what will become what we would call probably an instinctive response to things. And to get to like the end point quicker, to, you know, the the instead of holding the good stuff to the end, um, it comes from identity. Meaning our right system is always saying, who am I? Who are my people? And how do we act? It's very interesting. Some of the biblical, the, the Christians that have studied, they, they kind of are deep into what they've learned in brain science, and they look at then what the scriptures are saying, and basically the way the, the secular brain scientists talk about the right hemisphere is that it keeps three views of yourself in, in focus all the time. You as an individual, you as a part of a group, and then what do people like us do? And since this is operating faster than conscious thought, as that right system becomes trained, meaning nothing less than, more and more I see myself as who I am because of Christ. That's my core identity. What does someone who is a loved child of God, who's been given the Holy Spirit, who's had everything that needs to be taken care of, taken care of, so that the accusations of the evil one have no, nothing to stick on to, what does that kind of person think about themselves? Who are the people of that kind of person, and what do people like that do when they're in a frustrating situation with their windows and their wife asking them a question? Different than what I did, I'll just say that. But what happened to me, which I, I, I've never timed this, but I would say much more quickly than normal. Yes, I'll prefer. <laughs> you know what I said to myself? That's not who I am. I'm not a guy that snaps at his wife when he's in a frustrating situation. Now, I actually had done that, but what I'm saying is, if I'm going to operate from my core identity, that's not what something I'm going to be doing. And the fact of noticing it and thinking about it is part of training. Because it's then like, yeah, not that. And your right system is kind of taking note of that. So the right system is uh, identity, who, who are my people. And I would suggest our people, primarily and foundationally, are our brothers and sisters in Christ, the people in our family of God. But as this series is titled, Relational Parenting 101, for those of us who have children or grandchildren, our people must include our children and grandchildren. 
And so the most powerful thing that we can do for our children and grandchildren, and really our brothers and sisters in Christ, is to be picturing what maturity can look like. You, you can't believe how many times in scriptures they say things like, imitate me as I imitate Christ or something like that. They're presenting what the brain scientists are now figuring out is the way the right system learns. The right system is completely nonverbal. The left system is where the word language system is. The right system is nonverbal. So if you say, what does godliness look like? It's going to be like attitude, actions, and then your left system can say, well, let me figure out some words to describe that because uh, you're going to get up and teach in a little bit. So I'm using my left system, obviously, to put this thing together. But if it's not happening in the right system, I'm just kind of pretending to be someone that's mature. It's actually not happening over here. I'm just telling you about it over here on the left side. So uh, Paul goes on, and he's writing a letter to the Ephesian church, and he says, literally, put off your old self. Verse 22. That word is the same word as used like, you know that old ratty t-shirt you wear when you do projects? Uh, put that in the trash. <laughs> that is just not reflective of who you now are. So it's literally saying, change your image of who you are. That old person that got triggered by all that stuff and has those kind of attitudes and responses and all that, that's not who you are. This is who you are. Put that on. And for us to put that on, it literally means to imagine ourselves and live out of the reality of this new person that I am versus that old person that I used to be. This is not a give me a list of 10 things I'm supposed to do and a list of 10 things I'm not supposed to do and I'll think about it, I'll solve that problem and try hard not to be the person that does those bad things and to be the person that does the good things. See, this... You can't think fast enough for that to happen before you're already, you know, snapping at your wife. So that's how God, that's how creative God is. He gives us a system that can be trained so that literally his children can become the kind of people that more and more are instinctively, or you could almost say intuitively, or before they could even think about it, they're acting like Jesus would in that kind of situation with your personality. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, corrupt through deceitful desires, which basically I think he's calling there for character transformation and living out of our new identity. And to be renewed, renewed in the spirit of your mind, I think you're talking about the right system there. To more and more see yourself as you truly are in Christ. That's what the, the journey of maturity is. That more and more we, we think of ourselves and we see ourselves, and our right system is literally saying, who are you? You're a dearly loved child of God who's walking with him, uh, joyously looking forward to that day when you will be called before him and he'll say, Come on in, Nathan, my well, my good and faithful servant who's done well on the journey. And we can literally be looking forward to that day, and that's, that's going on over, over here. Uh, I just put my, my note to myself here. Doesn't this sound more like the right system's identity transformation than left system knowledge acquisition, figuring out the right way to do it, and then doing it? And then he says, and put on the new self, created in the likeness of God, that's who we now are, in true righteousness and holiness. So we literally can be righteous, do right things, and holy, set apart, different than the world around us. And then 25 to 32 describes some identity-based new ways to live. And I don't believe 25 to 32 is giving us the list of things to do that we think about real hard and try to be the, what it says in 25 to, to 32. Though that's the way I understood it in the past, and that's the way I think I was taught it, even in seminary. And then 5.1, he says, be imitators of God. Do you know that our right system is 
uh, full of mirror neurons, they're called. Mirror neurons. The right system doesn't learn by words, lectures, outlines. Let me give you the information about how to be a good Christian. Do these things, don't do these things, okay. It learns by imitation. You see someone responding. Let's say I was working with a buddy and his wife called and we couldn't figure out the problem. And he was just so kind and gentle and just like completely about his wife and what, what she was asking about. It's like, like I'm thinking, that's not what I did. <laughs> but my right system is going, but you could. What would it look like if you started acting like that when you're frustrated instead of the way you do act? What would that look like? And so we learn by imitation. Now picture this, parents. 18 years, or 25, or 30. <laughs> what are they looking at? What are they looking at? You and your wife doing stuff. <laughs> you know what their right system is doing? I guess that's what it looks like to be a man. I guess that's what it looks like. Not this whole thing, do what I say, not what I do. That's not how God made our brain. <laughs> they are going to do what you do, not what you say. That's the absence of what people say. So if you have something in your life that you do not want your kids imitating, maybe that would be a clue that God's saying to you, what are you going to do about it? Because they will imitate that if I don't deal with it. If you have eruptive anger, if you have passive aggressive tendencies, if when you get frustrated on a window brush, <laughs> you start being grumpy and snapping at people, what are we going to do about it? And it's not try harder not to do that because you do it and then you realize you've done it. So the try harder, it's like the left system can kind of figure some stuff out and give you some some ideas if you tell the left system this is who I am this is who my people are and we're trying to figure out how to be the people that we are in various situations the left system feels okay that's my new challenge to come up with solutions problems suggestions related to he's a follower of Jesus who's loved by God who's looking forward to being with Jesus and having Jesus uh, commend him and reward him, well done, good and faithful servant. Okay, so what does that look like? The right system is aware of what the left system is doing. The left system is not aware of what the right system is doing. It assumes whatever identity the, the right system is currently embracing, that's the left system's uh, starting point. So, uh, just some examples of this. So, uh, kids... Like various, like if you go to a high school, especially a large high school, there might be five or seven or ten kind of groups. The popular kids, the athletes, the, the goth kids, the, the, the nerds, the whatever. And it's like, you can kind of tell who they are by looking at them. If you would ask them, why are you dressing that way or why do you do the things you do, they're thinking they're going to be completely and totally unique in the world. An outside observer can look at it and go, you're imitating each other. <laughs> the tattoos are different, but I mean, you know, it, there's a similarity in, the, in the, big, the big picture. It's because their right system has now identified themselves as goth or popular or nerd. So then the, so then the kind of stuff it does is just running everything through the grid of, this is who I am, these are my people, and this is what we do. And they're not thinking about it. It just happens. How awesome would it be as followers of Jesus if the, you know, who am I is centered around who we are in Christ. Who are my people is centered around being in the family of God and particular uh, application to local families of believers though broadly applied to all the believers throughout the world, what do people like us do? That's where we start. You know, I think I'm going to start spending some time, maybe every day, but as many days as possible, just kind of reading and learning about what God is like, what Jesus is like. 5.1 says, uh, 
The imitators of God. Right system imitates. How do you imitate God? I mean, I can picture how I imitate my parents because I'm around them all the time in the house. How do I imitate God? So you kind of have to know and picture kind of uh, right system learns by pictures. You have to picture God. What if a human being was God? And you could kind of like watch the human being. So God sends Jesus. And we have the stories of Jesus in the Bible and then the stories of Jesus' followers, which as we read those stories and as we read even the, if you want to say the informational parts, we can picture a situation where I can kind of see myself in that situation. And look how they're responding to that situation. I can imagine myself doing something like that. And so we're training ourselves in Godliness. So the reading of the Bible if you want to say the quiet time, which my friend from seminary was really good at all the prescribed, dutiful practices. Not that there's anything wrong with those practices, but if their focus is on, you know, getting the, enough information so that I can make right choices and become mature, they're not, not working that way. But if instead I'm having an intimate, loving relationship with a God who cares about me and who sent his son for me and gave me the revelation of the scripture so that everything I need, God has given us everything we know for life and God in us, Peter tells us. Peter, who walked with Jesus in the flesh, was martyred. How do people get to the point where they're willing to be martyred as a follower of Jesus if something hasn't changed in their character? So, um, Matthew 7, 12. Uh, you could say the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, is Jesus giving a picture in answer to this question that the right system is always asking. What do people like us look like? What do we do in various situations? What do we do in this situation? What do I do when I'm frustrated about a project and my wife triggers me? What do people do in those situations? So Jesus says, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who do this and that. And that. You know, you have heard that it says, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, even if you look at a woman lustfully. Okay? So he said, it's not just about what you actually do that you could be convicted for. It's but what's going on inside. And so what do people like us do? We don't just focus on external behavior and making sure that lines up and is right. We're actually thinking about what do we think about? What our attitude is? How, how are we triggered? What do we respond when we're triggered? So, um, the right system. Uh, I'll just give a, a, an overview vision here for the whole series. Um, my hope for this series is that we would begin to see, to embrace, and joyfully practice in our relationships and in our parenting, if we're in that situation, or grandparenting, the relational reality, attention focus, joy, and love that God offers to us and is pictured for us in Jesus. So, not that this is uh, necessary, but... Um, because our best cells flow out of the integrated functioning of our, I believe, our right and left systems, and you don't need to have brain science to know this. You just, God knew what he was doing, and he gives us scriptures, and then it's like, it's almost like uh, after the enlightenment, the age of reason, the human beings are really awesome, we can figure everything out, then even the church got kind of sucked into thinking, what I would say, from a left system dominant perspective, that everything is a problem to be solved. And so the church's focus kind of got shifted away from God's original design as the scriptures would lay it out. And I believe there's a kind of a revival or returning to the understanding of the, relation, the central relationality of what it means to be a follower of Jesus versus an informational-centered focus. Our best lives flow out of the integrated functioning of our brain's two systems when our right system is operating as a master and our left system is operating as the right system's willing assistant or partner helper. So, 
what they found out basically is there's four levels on the right side, and then you could say the left system is a, like a fifth thing. And everything that happens, happens from the bottom to the top. And then as identity is clarified, then the left system comes online to solve whatever problems come up from the perspective of my current identity. And in that situation, my current identity was a frustrated guy who thinks God has shortchanged him by not giving him enough information or help to fix the windows. If I devote my time and spend my money on windows and start the project, doesn't God love me, love me enough to give me the right information, point me to the right YouTube, uh, have a friend stop by who knows how to do such things, or something like that. I mean, why would I have to experience this kind of frustration? And then my wife asks me the question. Or offers a suggestion, not knowing the, the details of this terrible and intense problem that I'm facing right now. See, that is not the way God wants me to... That's not who I am. I would just say it that way. That's not who I am. And the sooner I figure that out, the more quickly I will get back in alignment. So when we uh, do communion, confess your sins or examine yourself, basically he's asking, not like, you know, did you commit adultery this week? Have you cheated on your taxes? Did you break into any stores? You know, oh yeah, I'm good to go. <laughs> I haven't done any really bad stuff. You know, no, he's talking about, I think, more primarily, what kind of person are you being in your interaction? So, uh, the, the four levels, and I just want to real quickly uh, touch on these four levels, um, if I can remember what they are here. Uh, <laughs> the, the attachment level is the lowest level down here. And there's a, if you want to get the notes, there's actually, I can tell you what parts of the brain that is. But it's the deepest part of our brain. It's the most basic thing about us. It's the, the core level of uh, relationships. <clears throat> and its greatest pleasure, or the fuel that it operates on, is relational joy. A lot of the things you're learning about the, the brain is from studying, like infants, and they'll, they'll wire them up and they'll like put them in with their mother. And the mother will go, oh, it's so good to see you. Or like when Harrison, our 18-month-old grandson, comes over and she's, he's with his Grammy and she's talking to him and he's jabbering and he can't understand it. But last week he did say, Papa! I'm going, that's the first word I've heard that kid say. <laughs> it's not the first word he said, but it's the first word I heard him say and it really touched my heart deeply. <laughs> His brother was calling for lunchtime, and I was not responding. So Harrison, 18 months old, it's Harrison gets involved and says, Papa. Now, I joyfully responded to that, and Jeannie regularly joyfully responds to him. You know what that does inside of that kid's brain? This is life. This is what I'm made for. For people to be happy to be with me. To have their entire focus to be on me and what I need and want. This brings me great joy. And up until four years old, that is what life is about for a kid. And it is a gift to our kids to give them uh, major and regular and consistent do doses of joy. But it's interesting, even we adults like joy. What they're finding is... To have someone be happy in your presence, to look you in the eye and be kind of, you can say, I think they're glad to see me. I think they're glad that I'm here. You could, they're glad and you can feel that they're glad. That's what relational joy is. At the very core level of the right side of our brain, the right center, the right system, is this idea that I want to be enjoyed. We can give that gift to each other. We can give it to our kids. There's probably nothing more central and primary that a parent can be giving to their kids, and particularly through the first four years of life, than relational joy. It is one of the reasons God talks so much about love and how much he loves us, because he wants us to feel in his presence like 
we want the kid, Harrison, to feel in her presence. That's what God wants us to feel, is like we're Harrison and God is like <laughs> just so happy to be with us. Happy and enjoy us and all that. So, so if this right system is lined up the way God designed it to line up, you can imagine the difference it would make in how, you could say, instinctive or intuitive responses to different things would, would be different if your, your core identity and subtleness of who you are and your being loved is, is there versus whether it's not there. So uh, the second level um, is uh, called assessment, or it's, it's the fight-or-flight center. And remember, in, in your right system, every six times per second, these, these things are going like this. You know, am, am I loved? Is there joyful joyfulness at my presence? Is this a scary situation or a safe situation? The kid is born with those two things in place. The top two levels have to be developed, have to be built after you're born, and have to be trained after you're born to include, I believe, the rest of our lives if we're a follower of Jesus so that it becomes uh, clearly and focused on who we are in Christ. If we get stuck at uh, level two, this is where PTSD comes in. Like everything is something to be feared. And you never, you can never move out of, of this is a scary situation. If the right system is not operational and people are left system dominated and their, their core identity is I need to protect myself because bad stuff's going to happen to me. They will run everything in their life through the grid of fear. And there are six core fears that, that even babies are born with that most people have one of these six core fears. Um, fear, anger, shame, sadness, disgust, and hopeless despair will be dominant if joy doesn't like fuel them away from that. So you're either going to be fueled by joy or by fear and evidenced by one of those six things. And if that's the identity that your right system is kind of saying, okay, that's who they say I am. I'm a fearful person. I'm an angry person. I'm a person that's disgusted about just about everybody. I'm a person that's so sad, there's nothing to bring joy into my life. I'm a person about whom there is no hope for anything good to ever happen again. Then the left system is starting to live and operate out of well, what do we do if life is hopeless? Or what do we do if everything is something to be angry about? <laughs> what do we do if, you know, everything is something to be fearful about? And then what if you become a follower of Jesus? What if you start, and he says, hey, take that off. Put this on. This is who you are. Well, it doesn't just happen like that. We have to, like, practice. That's why he says train yourself to be godly. So then level three is um, it's called attunement it's where our sense of connection to other people and to God happens so if you're stuck at level 2 with some sort of fear or anger or something you're not going to feel deeply connected to other people uh, someone very close to me one time in the past um, after he spent some time with me and I was in a uh, challenging situation, a relationally challenging situation, and just kind of operating in there. And he was overwhelmed with imagining what it would be like if he was in my place. And he said this to me, he says, I'm going to go home and hug my computer monitor. Now, I'm not suggesting that's a good thing. What he was thinking is, the last thing in the world I can imagine is moving into any more relationality in my world. Because the only safe place for me to be is where there are no people that can react or have issues, and just a computer that only does what I tell it to do and respond the right, you know, it's like... So he's completely not wanting to go there. So the more we feel that we are loved, the more we experience being loved by people in our family, in our community, the more our identity will be clarified as to being a person who is loved, and the more we will have love to give other people. And then the final one is, uh, let me 
see if I can find it here. <laughs> Identity, where it basically brings everything together, and this is like, like when it's cycling through, the last phase is this is who you are, this is who your people are, this is what we do in these kind of situations. So my hope and prayer is that the next time I take upon a project that I don't know what I'm doing, I'm doing it for the first time, I go to the YouTube and I get me the, what I think is the way that, you know, the pattern to follow, and something frustrating happens, or it just doesn't seem to be working, or it's like, I, what more can I do here? And Jeannie asks me a question, or offers a suggestion, well, have you tried this? Or maybe you should do that. Rather than just immediately being triggered, it's like, this is the wife that I love. I am secure in who I am. I have a loved community. God loves me. I'm a follower of Jesus. And respond differently. Not having thought about it ahead of time. Just be that kind of different person. And I know that's what I want for myself. I want to offer it to my grandkids and to my kids. And I want to offer it within our community. And I hope you guys all do too. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity we will have in the coming weeks to train ourselves to be godly, to practice being who we now are, to put on our new selves. Uh, from brain science, we could just say to, uh, to make sure our right system is operating as you designed it to in cooperation with who we are as your redeemed and loved children. I just pray that there's great stories in the days to come of an increase in love, joy, hope, and community bondedness and influence within the lives of each other because we're imitating each other's good practices. And to you we give all praise and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>